So did you want to move on to your second question? I think Tom should be joining us shortly, so this might work out really well. Great. Um, oh, you know what? I would like to say I, I'm, a lot of people said that they liked my questions particularly. Um, maybe that's just something that people were saying to everybody, but I got a lot of that feedback. And I think it was because I had answered the white men's questions and I had answered women's questions and I started to get the sense of, you know, the problem is they really, people really think that they're being very clear because they're in it, they're in their own bubble. And when I turn around and say, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about, they get very offended and they're like, what do you mean? You know, you should totally know this, this is common knowledge. And it's like, it's common knowledge to you. It is not common knowledge to me. And I think that ties into something that you were saying earlier. So that's why it, it just popped into my head. So I was very careful in my questions to the point of being really boring and tedious about the way I was asking them and um, driving Christy crazy. Cause like, oh, I've re, I re uploaded this question again. I just fixed the wording. Um, you weren't the only one. It's okay. And it turns so, out. So it was, it was to be very, very clear and specific as much as you possibly could. And I think that's why my question sort of went over well is that people um, didn't feel like, uh, you know, there's a lot of complaints like this is a disingenuous question. This is a disingenuous question. And some of them really are. Some of the questions that I got, um, when I was answering questions were so obviously loaded, they might as well have been, you know, why the hell do you suck so much, you know? Um, but some of them, you know, like when I, uh, sugar tits asked a question, uh, about like, uh, workers, you know, being left, let to go home every time they had their periods and, feminism has gone toxic and I just went um citations please and it, it turned out there was some I don't know one well, company well, in the UK it's like but I wouldn't know that I'm not in your bubble and I don't know random UK personnel problems so fallacies. right well, like, what I want to know is why didn't you ask answer the question of why do you suck so much I mean that's such an obvious story. I mean the, the, your refusal to answer, <laughs> your, refu your silence on the topic only incriminates you further, Chris. That's all I can say. Well, that's true. It is true. Um, what can I say? I think it's all feminism's fault <laughs> because feminism. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Because feminism believes that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Feminism made me do it. <laughs> yeah, the, the feminism monster that lives under the bridge. <laughs> All right, so now I'll go on. I'll stop wasting everybody's time. Um, so my second question was about Muslims. Um, and it was about, uh, it was sort of a two-parter. And the first part was, you know, if you sort of say that you're all about the ideas, you're not about the people, but you're sort of surrounded by bigotry and hate and people throwing these terrible slurs out, or saying awful things about the people, then, you know, why would anybody take that seriously was kind of, was sort of the gist. I was a lot more careful about my wording, so. Um, and then the sort of the second thing was, when you talk about moderate Muslims, would you have those, you know, would you invite people onto your channel? Um, and, Where I, from all the responses I got, uh, I came to believe that I was in fact projecting something onto people in the sense that when I, when I uh, go to make a YouTube video and communicate something, I generally have a goal in mind and an audience in mind and I tailor it to them like I'm, uh, you know, there's a plan there and it seems like the people who perhaps uh, spend a lot of their time um some of the people 
who spend a lot of their time criticizing Islam or, you know, criticizing his ideology don't necessarily have a plan or either that or they have a plan that I'm not getting, if that makes sense. Like to me, I'm looking at, okay, Muslims are 1.6 billion people strong and they're the fastest growing religion. So if I'm going to talk to them and I know that I have all these sort of bridges that I already have to hurdle, right? Like there's language and cultural issues that I'm sort of got to go through just to get the conversation going. So I'm going to try to, you know, get rid of any um, additional hurdles that might otherwise be getting in my way. And I'm not going to let people say raghead because, you know, I know that a Muslim person will take one look at that and say, no, this person's an asshole, right? I'm not going to, I don't care what they have to say about the Quran. What the hell do they know? They think they're just bigots. Um, so for that reason, you know, I have that very much in mind and it has puzzled me why they would even bother like to go out of their way to criticize Islam while making it almost a definite that Muslims would never watch them or any Muslims that did would become convinced that they were just hateful and therefore wouldn't take them seriously. Is this making sense to other people? Because this is sort of a puzzle now for me that I'm trying to work out. Yeah, I, I get the impression with a lot of people, and obviously it varies from person to person, but I get the impression that a lot of them aren't doing it in order to try and flag up problems with Islam. They're just bigots, and that's part of the problem. Those people make a conversation impossible. As for the other people, I don't think that they necessarily see that distinction. I think they are happy to ally themselves with people who are incredibly nefarious in their intent and um, essentially you see them possibly as useful idiots, possibly as actual genuine allies, and it makes it so toxic that it's difficult to engage. I mean, I know both Christy and I are um, critics of Islam. Uh, and and I am as well, and well, I've, yeah, I've been yeah. specific about... Yeah, no, know, the I'm... reason I didn't add Christy uh, uh, CC there uh, was because mm -hmm. I'd not discussed it with her before, but I, I know I had with uh, Christy. So all three of us are critics of Islam, but find it difficult. It's almost like walking on eggshells because they've placed those eggshells there. Right. And then, of course, they, they would say that um, we place the eggshells there because we call them Islamophobic or, or bigoted, but then sometimes they really are. Like, I'm not going to lie about that and not call out bigotry, because to me, bigotry... If there's one human idea that has caused more problems than religion, it would be this sort of, just sort of a general bigotry, in-group, out-group, these people over here, you know, um, which is sort of just a common denominator of all kinds of genocide and hate and everything well, evil, you know. Well, I, I see them as, as intrinsically linked in many ways because part one of the driving forces behind much bigotry is tribalism and that can absolutely be based on religion yeah i mean you see and it doesn't have to be different religions you look at i mean uh, not far from me at all uh, northern ireland they're all christians but yet they fucking despise one another for no other reason than you believe in a slightly different version of the same god as i do mm. my my perception of it is that the channels that make that kind of content that we're talking about in terms of critiquing islam are made by people who are expecting an audience that is already hostile to Islam. They're not expecting anybody watching to actually be Muslim. And so I think that informs a lot of the discourse and also maybe just the sort of lip service to I'm um, criticizing ideas not, but not people and then going ahead and making that mistake of conflating people and ideas again. Mm. We talked about in the feminism part. So I think that that, that is definitely part of the problem. Yeah, but I mean, I, I know from my own personal experience, there's loads of stuff that I'd like to have said or, or videos I might have made, um, but I don't want people to associate my channel with theirs. And I don't just do that out of tribalism, I do that because there are lots of channels out there doing that sort of content, and many of them are deeply bigoted. So even when you're saying things that aren't actually bigoted, you can come across that way because people 
have heard that sort of thing from actual bigots. And that's really toxic and dangerous in terms of public discourse. Well, what yeah. I find too is, you know, um, the, there's a critique that comes up very in, during specific incidents about sexual assault and um, refugees or people from um, predominantly Muslim countries. But, you know, what the other side isn't doing then is taking that outrage about sexual assault in that particular case and acknowledging that if you want to actually really powerfully critique Islam, then feminist critique is incredibly powerful on the basis of human equality. And if they became very familiar with feminist critique, that they'd actually be able to construct some really powerful arguments um, about Islam and the way that it views gender relations. Yeah. But it's, you know, they don't go that far. And I think, you know, this, the resistance to the idea that feminism could be in any way useful yeah. is actually stopping them from making good arguments. Yeah, I think, I think that's actually a really good point um, mm -hmm. and uh, links back into a, a thing that I said earlier about um, the idea of conceding any point means their entire house of cards collapses. It's a very, very strange attitude to have. And I think shows an inherent insecurity in their own philosophy, if that makes sense. But um, mm. to bring it back to the, the point of, you know, Islamic rape or whatever, this thing that they've got this um, obsession with at the moment. Again, part of it, you know, you can see that it's based on bigotry in, in large part, not necessarily all of them, of course, but in large part because these are the very same people who will defend white rapists but yet, once you start getting a few brown people raping, all of a sudden it's an epidemic, it's rape culture, it's this, that, and the other. And you think, well, hang on, how can that possibly be? And then you look at the skin colour or the region of the world these people are from, and all of a sudden it clicks and makes sense. The very same people that will defend Brock Turner are absolutely mm. outraged by the very same thing being done by brown folk. Mm. Yeah. Um... To get back to, to Christie's point for a moment, um, and uh, because just how Islam had come up on my channel was when I was talking about um, the book Beyond God the Father, was, which was written by Mary Daly back in the day. Um, and one of her major points is we have to attack um, religion because it's misogynist, but it works the other way around, too. Like, if you point out that this whole narrative that these patriarchal religions are based on, that women are subservient and lesser and inferior, if you start to twist that and turn that on their heads, then you are implicitly and directly attacking their whole belief system. And that, you know, you're showing that, oh no, this thing that God created, it's not like that at all. So there's a problem here, and you, a logical issue that is just about to be flipped right on its head, right? Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so an empowered woman is an implicit attack on patriarchal religions. Yeah, definitely. And if you know people who want to critique Islam take up a feminist critique, then mm. it's going to be coming, they're going to have to face the same kind of issues that we have gotten to in terms of where we are in our feminist theoretical development, which is not just about giving women the right to vote. You know, they need economic independence so that they can make a living and be truly, you know, economically free to make decisions about their lives. They need health care or reproductive um, control over their body so they can time the number and spacing of their children to best optimize their family and what they can afford. You know, so you get into wider and wider issues about women's humanity and then you start to unpack things about, well, why is it that men don't get to take time off and be good fathers? And you have all of the same issues coming up about the questioning and breaking down patriarchy and restructuring it in a way that better ref reflects you know, the concept of egalitarianism and humanism. Mm. And, that, and that would be actual egalitarianism rather than the pathetic right. facade that some people put up. And there is a progressive movement, a democratic movement, a feminist movement within Islam. Um, uh, some people may argue about that, but I, I mean, to me, as a feminist, I don't tell other people what to believe in terms of their religions. And I don't, I'm not holding back women's rights until they've done what I told them to do and started thinking the way that I, I tell them to think, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it, it may be that 
the expectation when I look at the problems that Europe is facing now with immigration and with um, you know uh, these various immigrants from Middle East and and Northern Africa um, they'll be lucky if that sell if that is sorted out in a generation uh, you know just looking at history I don't know if you guys agree I it just that's yeah. the sort of thing it takes a long time to work out and it takes yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I think that's important because the idea that you, I mean, the idea that you could get rid of their religion is an absurdity. So clearly focusing purely on that is ridiculous. Yeah, and I think it's also important to recognize that um, change comes from within. Mm. You know, um, it, it's, it's not going to be um, secular Western feminists that are, that's going to get change in Islam. It's going to be moderate, liberal, feminist men and women, like the men in Iran who were um, putting headscarves on themselves and taking pictures to stand in solidarity with their wives who were being forced to wear the head covering. Mm. Um, you know, we need those allies. We need the men to stand up for the women and not just true. the women to stand up for the women. True, um, true. You know, the one... Sorry, uh, the, the one addendum I would add to that would be the, the ways in which Western feminists, liberal feminists can have impacts is by forcing Western governments to support secular forces in the region. Mm. By, not, by forcing our governments not to sell weaponry to Saudi Arabia, which is then used to crush, uh, at least in part, secular forces in Yemen, for instance. Right. And if I could just throw in, because been, it's been floating around, and I've been waiting for a pause in the conversation to throw this in. So on the issue of us criticizing Islam, you know, I did a hangout with the skeptic feminists where I did a feminist critique of the burqa. And I laid out from a feminist perspective why I think that it's a special case of being a situation where the state should intervene on behalf of somebody who is powerless in order to bring some equity that otherwise can't exist in that relationship in the, in the situation where women are wearing burqas. Now, I don't want to debate the issue, but the point was the comment section on that video was really quiet. <laughs> really quiet. Not a lot of comments. And then later when we had done our video and it was the response video was being done, the live stream of it, I think with Kraut and T, right? At one point, mm. Um, he was going on about Islam because that's what he does. And he said something about, you know, these people don't make videos on Islam. And I was in the chat. I actually think, uh, Cece, you were in the chat too. Yeah. And we wanted to, I was like, oh, well, c can we get them distracted and talked about talking about us <laughs> during their live stream? And they did. They totally like, <laughs> went off topic and they started trying to have conversations with us. And, so that was a lot of fun. But, well, it, um, it is it is fascinating to hear that because I know loads of feminists who've done videos about these things and it's almost oh, like yeah. they're purposefully ignoring it because it goes against their narrative. Yes, and then in the comments I said, well, I did a video on Ban the Burqa. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, you did a video on Ban the Burqa. Well, have you ever done one on Muslim migration patterns? I'm like, um, moving the goalpost fallacy, you just well, said. Well, Chris, you, you, know? you have never done one on uh, falafel production. That is a disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it is, that is always the way, you know, it, if you've done X, Y, Z, then you're wrong because you didn't do, you know, well, TUV as well. And on, it's on, just ridiculous. on a slightly silly point, I think Chrissy will definitely appreciate uh, the British comedian Stuart Lee had a fantastic <laughs> piece about uh, when people ask him to do jokes about Islam. And it was this fantastic skit. You should definitely search out on YouTube. Um, uh, where he goes, he does like really silly jokes about um, uh, <laughs> about like uh, oh the uh, the, um, the the top name for um, British kids is uh, Mohammed, and that's just the girls. And then, he, and, and then he does this fake skit between the person going, no, 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 you don't do jokes about Muslims like that. And basically, the whole point is they want them to do hateful, bigoted jokes about Muslims. Right. And that's the point. We're not going to do those fucking jokes, or he's not going to do those jokes. We're not going to do those videos. But that doesn't mean that we haven't done videos about Islam, just not in the bigoted way you want us to. Yeah, I mean, I worked. Sorry. I was just going to echo that. I feel more, when people bring those issues up, like, why don't you make a video about Islam and women or Islam and whatever, it's, I always feel like it's, why don't you hate on Muslims more? It's not about critiquing Islam. And so I just wanted to say that I get the same thing impression that Kevin has. Yeah, I mean, I worked with um, Muslim doctors and nurses, and they were some of the, just the best people. You know, and I know when um, 
uh, when Syria was going to hell, uh, they brought over uh, a Christian doctor. They sort of rescued him out of Syria to bring him over because, you know, once things sort of get all fucked up, then all of a sudden it's everybody for their own side. And he was literally um, dodging machine gun fire every day to try to go to a hospital without water or medicine and try to, you know, save people's lives. And uh, it just got to it where his entire family was targeted. So there's, there's these Muslim people intervening because they their families know his families and they're bringing him over and they're they're helping out the the family um there was a muslim nurse who um when those 200 young women were or girls were kidnapped from the school she had gone over to that country um to nigeria nigeria yeah yeah the Bo boko haram yeah yeah um and she was trying, nothing really productive ever came of that. But, you know, I mean, there are people who are trying very hard. There are, um, there are entire female, um, I think, Kurdish military groups, you know, fighting ISIS yeah. right now. Yeah, the uh, parts of the YP, YPJ, I believe it is, the, the um, Civic Defense Forces, whatever they call themselves, yeah, are entirely... Yeah. Um, there's actually a fantastic article. If I find it, I'll hopefully Chrissy will link it below. Fantastic article of um, t uh, telling the story of a um, Kurdish woman who'd been sold into sex slavery by ISIS mm -hmm. who then joined one of those um, female, um, essentially paramilitary groups, you know, that, um, they're not officially state-sanctioned or anything. Um, and um, then, yeah, unfortunately, she was killed, but she... Um, she managed to take out a number of ISIS fighters and reclaim um, some town in uh, mm. Syria. It was fantastic. A really heartwarming fantastic. story. Yeah. And if I could chip in, you know, living in Cologne, it's a very international city. And I have uh, met several people from Iran since I've been here. And about half of them, I would say, when you talk to them, you know, about things, they'll come out as very secular. And mm. the, the fact is that they couldn't be secular back in Iran, but they can be in Germany. And when they have the opportunity, their lives re relax because they don't have the expectations and social pressures. So the other problem with dealing or treating Islam as a monolith is one, it's not even accurate in terms of how it divides up amongst itself in terms of its theologies and its sides and, you know, converts versus people who vote, you know, like families going back, whatever, like just traditional Arab. I've heard a lot about, I think it was um, recently about uh, the sort of racism of Islam, that it's mm -hmm. You know, only one people who are from the area are real Islam or Muslims, and then you know converts aren't aren't really the same level. But anyway, I'm getting off topic. Um, actually, I'm so off topic now that I forgot where I was going with this. That's all right. No, I mean it's uh, they want the most simplistic narrative that they can come up with, right? So they want it to be all about Islam, all about the Quran, uh, you know. That's the whole problem. Like, if you look at Saudi Arabia and you say, well, you have this historical monarchy, which is enriched beyond just insanity by oil money and is sort of using or manipulating the religion in their country to keep control because they want this absolute control. Uh, and of course we have all these sort of financial ties to saudi arabia and saudi arabia is probably one of the most awful regimes that is going today so but when you look at this very complicated picture and you hear people just saying well just read the quran like that's all you have to do and then you know everything and it's like no no it's it's slightly more complicated than that you know, Absolutely. and 10 different majority Muslim countries have 10 different governments and 10 different histories and 10 different, you know, relationships with us. So, yeah, well, this is the thing. Whenever, whenever you get this kind of this nonsense about um, uh, treating them as a monolith, uh, you do have to ask them, well, why are they killing each other then if they're all of one mind? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, Tom has not arrived yet, um, so I thought maybe to wrap it up, um, we could, do you guys want to talk at all about the Trump 
takes and give your reactions and thoughts? Yeah, sure. sure. If you want to, Kevin, do you want to go ahead? I think because you also did a video on it and it's, you know, you've been, I don't know if you continue to follow it, but I think you learned about it before I did. So Yeah, well, I learned about it sort of last night. Uh, I even put out a little vine of the, the kind of uh, the big moment, the um, grab them by the pussy. I mean, oh God. <laughs> and not just that, but it's just that, I mean, that's the kind of the headline of the piece, but it's not even the be all and end all of it at all. It basically essentially amounts to him tacitly admitting to being a rapist in essence it's it's really f a fascinating expose of, of of a kind of frat boy mentality within those rich types because obviously you've got bill bush involved as well you okay, believe is the sexual assault not rape but okay, oh yeah okay okay but i mean considering the no, fact he settled out of court with his first wife on a rape case it suggests to me that uh, oh god i mean I, I dread to think what kind of monster is behind closed doors um yeah, uh, I, I I did a quick thing basically asking those that claim to be on the left, people like Sargon and, and the Amazing Atheist, to come out and denounce the man because, you know, he is, like I said, a, a, as you rightly point out, Chrissy, a sexual assaulter rather than necessarily a rapist. Um, and they claim to be egalitarians, so clearly they would have to, you know, come out and denounce the man. Uh, they haven't, obviously, because they don't really give a shit. And uh, it's, it's that kind of frat boy bullshit which ultimately i think will be the death of of the trump campaign because ultimately the the very thing he's used to get to the position he is the kind of sensationalism of the media now they've given them something to be really upset about because it's mm. to do with i mean they were sort of okay with him shooting on latinas and blacks and people like that but now he's having to go at a white woman and that's oh, well. not on <laughs> we don't do that and and i wondered and this might be uncharitable of me, but I wondered if part of it was when he was talking about having a go at married white women. That's awesome. Um, uh, because I think that, you know, when I hear that certain conservatives are up in arms with, who haven't really cared about any of the other stuff, like, you know, we've cared all along, but like they could, yeah, whatever, whatever, it's fine. It's Trump, it's good. Um, but suddenly they're very upset. And I wondered if, you know, his talking about sort of pursuing very aggressively a married woman, you know, coming at her like a bitch or something like that, he said, um, wasn't part of the issue that they had with that. Yeah, I, I think that's possibly so. And not just that, but one, one thing that just annoyed me was his description of it has nice legs. Yeah. It. <laughs> not, a, not even a fucking being of any night, just it. Jeez. You wonder how a fifty-year-old man with daughters can can do that, can be that way. The question I ask, and it, it might sound incredibly crass in a way, and it's sort of supposed to be, but whenever you get someone like that, you ask them, "Well, would it be okay if I went and grabbed your wife's pussy?" Then, are you okay mm. with that? Would that be fine to do? Well, if you're on TV, yeah. Um. <laughs> well, YouTube's kind of like TV. <laughs> Um, I did see that uh, Sargon Carl had a hangout with a guest. And they watched the Trump tapes tape, and they were, of course, laughing it off and laughing at it. And basically, um, you know, I think Carl said that it was very cringy. Was the worst condemnation I heard. I only watched like the first five minutes because I kind of got the gist well, of it. I don't think but, we should be particularly surprised by that because if you remember the hangout you did with it, the debate you had, when you were describing the rape victim with semen. On her face, he was laughing like a school child. Yeah, and the I think the you know I'm going to sort of just speculate here, but I think the major reaction was anything with sexual assault and it should be mocked. And what he didn't realize um, is how seriously people in the states are taking this. That this admission of his, uh, that what he said he was doing, is it indicates that that's how he. he he physically treated women, and it gives a lot of credence to the stories that we've heard about him coming out and more coming out now. And, you know, you can't, as, as I think uh, Cece pointed out earlier, if you want an egalitarian society, then you can't have women in these situations and expect them to feel like they're in a fair workplace or that they're being treated with dignity. And I, you know, on Facebook, I posted 
an article from a man who was saying men need to denounce Trump because, you know, this guy was saying, I've been in a lot of locker rooms. I've never heard men talk like this in locker rooms, talk about women this way. That's my personal experience. But Trump doesn't speak for all men. Yeah. <laughs> when he laughs this off, is this is just how men talk because he reduces all men to what he does. And I think men should be standing up and saying, that's nothing like me. Don't speak for me, Donald Trump. Yeah, this, I, I mean, not... That's not what they did. I know. I know this is a, a typical uh, thing, a complaint. I think is quite right. But to turn, I'm going to turn a feminist thing into a oh, let's look at the men again bit by saying that not only is this incredibly obviously um, misogynistic, but the response to it is actually incredibly misandrist. Because imagine for a second that a feminist had come out and said, oh well, all men joke about sexually assaulting women and trying to fuck married women and cheating on their partners. That's all perfectly natural. They would be castigated. The very same people that spent so long desperately trying to, uh, you know, every time you had a conversation it was hashtag not all men. Well, apparently now it is all men. I was just picturing the feed of Thunderfoot and uh, Sargon and the Amazing Atheist and everybody just falling over themselves at that video, Kevin, like if a woman said that. Oh, I just got a message from Tom uh, saying that he'll be here in around 20 minutes, that he's running late. Um, 